first booth is in in Benelong, 200 votes, and it's showing no swing whatsoever. Do you know what uh, booth and, I, I don't and, know and, what and booth, how significant? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, we might, uh, we might try and keep an eye on and have a closer look at Benelong in a moment, but uh, Fran Kelly is on the telly room floor with one of the most astute political observers uh, here in this very crowded tally room tonight, and that's Craig Rucastle from The Chaser. Craig Rucastle, what do you make of the mood in this room? The public are queuing up outside it trying to get in this room. extraordinary. I'm not sure if they just heard about Kerry's ceremonial strip at the end of every election, but there is a queue down the road in Canberra. Like, literally, the whole of Canberra is here. It is quite extraordinary. It's like there's some kind of Britney concert on out here. So it is, it's an amazing mood here. People seem to be, yes, that, quite mad and boneheading and ridiculous, so that's a good sign for democracy. As uh, Kerry said, you're an astute reader of the mood of the electorate. Oh, exactly. Yeah. What have you been, uh, how do you read? I know the Chaser boys have been out covering almost every, every electorate in the country this week, uh, to the, the, today already. What are look, you picking up? Look, you don't only have to read Edmund Era, I think, uh, because that's the bellwether seat. That's all we actually read. We don't look at any of the other polls. And uh, I think with 0.5% in there, I'm willing to call this election for Labor. Um, but also, just, just to be on the safe side, with 0.5% of the vote in it, uh, Eden Monero, I'm willing to call this election for Liberals. So, and, but, you know, I am quite confident, I must admit, I've, having looked at the figures, I'm not going to call it for the Democrats just to be on the safe side, OK? We're at the business end of the night now, that's for sure, but there's, it's been a long campaign, there's been a lot of highs and a lot of lows. What's the high point of the campaign, in your view? Gee, the high point for me, look, it's been Tony Abbott's performance. I mean, it's a long campaign. It went long, you know, John Howard called it early. A lot of people said, you know, can you keep up the stuff up throughout the whole campaign to Tony Abbott? And he did. He did well. And I thought that was, that was a high point for me. Uh, being berated by the Prime Minister was a high point for me as well. And look, I think, I think the fact that Kevin, the fact that the Labor Party kept Kevin charged each night, you know, like kept the new batteries in Kevin each night, it did really well there. I thought he was going to run out towards the end. Might have to bring in a new robot. But... Uh why do you think it is, if the, if the voters do turn on the coalition tonight, do you think it is simply the it's time factor? Is that, is that what you're picking up? Look, uh, I think it's the fact that they're very confused who's who in this election and which to go for. Uh, a younger version of how, look, I think if they vote in Kevin Rudd, they've got another 11 years of him, they figure, look, we're going to have the same thing forever, pretty much. Uh, we, you know, it's, it's taken a while for, for Labor to, to manufacture a new, kind of, new jazzier, younger John Howe, but I think, I think it could mean that's the reason they're going for him in the end. But look, I, I don't know what it is. I think it's, it's not just the, it's time. It's, a, it's an underlying deep hatred of John Howard as well. I think that it's just coming through there. But I, it's, it's amazing. I, I still, despite my calls earlier, I, I'm not willing. I don't know which way it's going to go. I mean, you can never tell. No swing in Benelong yet, but if uh, if the coalition, if Labor gets up tonight, the biggest loser, you'd have to say, would be Peter Costello, bridesmaid. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. No, it is amazing. Look, uh, I, I, what the, the amazing thing I've found from this campaign is no one's talked about the fact that, you know, Howard could lose and the Libs would still win. I'm, Peter Costello could be Prime Minister tomorrow. I'd, I'd better call that, actually. Uh, uh, with 0.5% called in Edinburgh, uh, Peter Costello is the Prime Minister, people. Craig Rucastle, thank you very I think much. I've covered it all. <coughs> well, very nervous, Kerry. I'm sure Julia is too. These, it's a momentous occasion, as always, uh, the possibility of a change of government in the country. Um, my sense is that, I think to be realistic, there will be a swing to Labor. Labor will gain uh, seats tonight, uh, but uh, I still feel that they're going to fall short of that 16. Uh, as Julia said, 16 seats is a tough ask. Um, so I, and, and we've seen the polling trend back to us in these last few days. And I think that trend has occurred. It is tightening up, as we would have expected to do so. So I think it's going to be an interesting night because there'll be some seats we'll hold against the odds, others we might lose we weren't expecting to lose. So I think we'll all be on the edge of our seats all night. Also giving us his unique view of the election, the man usually behind the bar at the AFL footy show and tonight in the bar at Melbourne's Rising Sun Hotel, Trevor Marmalade. Is that a Kevin 07 t-shirt that Trevor? Actually, uh, Ray, under my new workplace agreement, I have to supply my own wardrobe. It's a, actually a Trevo 7. There we go. Uh -huh. And um, it's luckily for me, uh, the first consignment of Kevo 7 t-shirts were printed in Bali, so this is how they turned out. So I was lucky enough to get a couple of freebies. But uh, as you said, uh, we are here in uh, ALP Heartland in the uh, federal seat of Melbourne at the Rising Sun Hotel. And uh, I've been asking a few of the patrons here uh, which way they think the vote will go. And uh, so far, they're pretty split. They can't decide between Matt Corby or Natalie Gauchy. So it's uh, pretty much uh, a political hotbed of analysis here. But uh, it'll get the people involved. We're actually uh, starting up a bit of a drinking game here. Sly here is going to skull every time someone says, swing to Liberal. 
We've got uh, Reg here. He's going to scull every time someone says too close to call. And Macca here, he's going to scull every time someone says swing to labour. So uh, the word out of the ALP heartland is, though, that after the early results, uh, Kevin Rudd has got butterflies in his stomach. Uh, he's not nervous. It's just that he will eat anything. And a uh, request from a couple of the boys in the Keenail Lounge, uh, uh, Ray. Uh, the boys in the lounge there want to know if you can get the uh, supercomputer to work. They need to know the winner of the next at Bathurst Trots. We'll come back to you on that, mate. Thank you for that. Let's hope it's not too late at night for those boys drinking there. It is just, uh, just gone 7 o'clock uh, Eastern Daylight Time, so that means the polls have closed in Queensland. They've also closed in South Australia, Northern Territory. Still nervous. <laughs> Not as nervous as Nick, I would think, <laughs> with Queensland, oh, relaxed, Queensland very, looking very over your shoulder. Yeah. Uh, clearly, there, there isn't a sufficient swing yet to say that Labor will win this no. election. Um, I think we're holding up reasonably well in Victoria. Karangamite is a problem, but Macmillan is actually a small mm -hmm. swing to us. Uh, Latrobe, the swing against us is only 2%. That's not enough to lose the seat. Any sense of, of um, numbers there, though, in Latrobe, yeah, how on, big on the count is? Yeah, well, Latrobe is on 3% of the vote. Macmillan's on 4% of the vote. Um, so, and you're getting mixed results out of New South Wales. I, Patterson, um, the swing against us is very small on 5.6% of the vote. So I don't think yet it's um, no, no. clear that uh, there's the sort of swing to Labor that would give them comfort they could win this. Yeah? Remembering again, though, that the, uh, the, the, the seats of South Australia and Queensland are still yeah. to kick in. Sure. Uh, Julia and Nick, is either of you picking up any hint of Queensland at all? Well, in Bowman, they've got 2.9% counted and a swing against us of only 1.4%. Um, Capricornia, 1.6% to Labor. Flynn, only 2.2% to Labor. So at this stage, the swings don't look big enough to give Labor what they want. Uh, but I think we'll see a, ver a big variation yeah. across the state. Yeah. I've got a very small number in Morton, about seven to 800 votes, showing a swing of 3.8%. We need 2.8% for Morton, that's Graham Perrott. I've got an absurdly large swing in Dawson, 20.3, uh, with 3,000 votes we're counted. Treat that one so with great caution. <laughs> I think we will treat that with great caution. But Dawson is worth watching with the demographic shifts there and a good campaign. We still don't have any meaningful figures from Queensland, but. If Labor picks up two or three seats in Queensland, you're talking about a very narrow Labor victory. If Labor starts to pick up more seats than that, then they start to build up a bit of a majority. But they, they're probably gaining, and the problem is there's some very slow counts in some seats, extremely slow. Some, like Kingston, only one or two booths reporting, very slow. Um, so we're seeing enough swings in seats to suggest that the Labor Party is probably going to win this election. But we just need one or two seats which are lagging behind, and we need Queensland to be sure of that. But there's certainly the swing is 5.1%. It's at that point where Labor's just getting into office with enough seats. Let's go straight into the action. This is how the parties shape up tonight as we bring them to you. We move into Parliament House, into the House of Reps. 150 seats here. As we repeat, the target for holding or winning power is 706, uh, sorry, 76 seats. 76 at the moment, the coalition has 88 seats. Labor, 60, with two independents. It could be an edge of the seat night, although the indications are it's going to be w more than that, Laurie. And I think by the time we come out of Queensland, our lead will be probably sufficient for the night. But um, it's, we're probably, what, 25 minutes away? from getting enough conclusive evidence out of Queensland. Michael? Well, I think the interesting thing is this has certainly not been the landslide that, that a lot of people predicted, and a lot of people inside the Labor oh, Party predicted. Hearted. Um, and in fact, it's arguable that it's still in the balance. And of all of the polls you looked at... Argue it for me. You're sounding well, like Dennis Shanahan. They've won two in Tasmania. They've now won back. So they've won two in Tasmania. They won two in Victoria, that's four. Three in South Australia, that's seven. They've won six in New South Wales, which is 13. Although John Howard is just behind, but he's edging back. So they've won 12 or 13. They need 16 in total to win. But they could lose a couple in Perth. Now, if they win a couple in Perth, they've got to win seven in Queensland. If they win seven in Queensland, well, they probably deserve to win the election. But that's probably the direction. Need it's very early in Queensland, Michael. That's the direction, clearly, isn't it, in Queensland? It's around that. It's around that. You All I'm simply saying is that there were plenty of people that said this election would be, oh, Labor would get 30 seats, 25 seats. The poll which said they had 57% of the vote. The two-party preferred vote nationally is 53-47 at the minute. So whichever pollster had 53-47, they get the uh, Canada Diet Coke. 
Well, Queensland has not been tracking well for us. Uh, I'm very worried about Mel Bruff in, in, uh, in Longman. Uh, he's been a fantastic minister and he seats more than 6%, but the Queensland polling is poor. And as they say, the surf never hits one swimmer. So if it is bad in Queensland, uh, it might take down Mel Bruff, which would be a terrible thing for the government, a terrible thing for the Liberal Party. The big factor there is obviously the parochial factor of the Queenslander for Prime Minister. In fact, I gather Labor has had skywriters about Brisbane today, a Queenslander for PM. Yeah, and a lot of their booth booth wrapping in Queensland was, you know, elected Queenslander for uh, for Prime Minister. Yeah, and another and, one for Treasurer. And another one for Treasurer, goodness me. Um, they were showing that though in the polls, were they? It's certainly up to now, it looked like they'd, they'd come back in Queensland. Look, there's no doubt that, that you know, the Liberal Party has had a historically good vote in Queensland. They've done very well federally for a long period of time. When, when the swings are on, they obviously are going to be biggest in the, in the states where you've done best. And that's why New South Wales, and particularly Queensland, are going to be bad for the government if, if the swing's on. And as I said, the early figures are not encouraging for the government. All right, it's probably wrong, I think, uh, to talk about Queensland when they're still voting there. But uh... Ray, I was just wondering how the Labor Party authorised the skywriting ads in Queensland. Uh, I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> All right, let's zero in on uh, some blue ribbon territory for the Liberal Party now. What should have been sacred ground but has become one of the talking points of this election, Sydney's North Shore. And that includes, here we go, that includes the PM's elected of Benelon, Laurie. Yeah, well, the, I, even the Liberals admit that John Howard is in deep trouble, as I said. Uh, Maxine McKee has waged a good campaign there. It's not only kept John Howard pinned down and stopped him campaigning elsewhere, but he is at very real risk of losing that seat. You look to those five, they are they're true blue, aren't they? The, the heavy the, Liberal seats. Well, that's right. And in North Sydney, uh, another minister, Joe Hockey, could be in trouble there as well, uh, up against another TV personality, Mike Bailey. All right, let's cross now to Edwin Benelong. We're talking about Ellen Fanning's on the spot. Ellen? G'day, Ray. I've just been listening to what Laurie's been saying. Look, there's every indication John Howard is worried about this seat. There are 46 booths in Bennelong, and John Howard has been to an awful lot of them today, more than he has in previous years. He voted in a booth in Labor Heartland, a place called Ermington West. So that suggests to me he's going for, for every vote he can get. And if he does lose this seat, and historic loss it would be, first sitting Prime Minister to lose a seat since 1929, if he does, it'll be for two big reasons. One will be the Asian vote, which is up around 25% in this seat. It will suggest to you that the significant numbers of those people have switched over uh, to Labor at this election. They've been reminded over and over again of John Howard's anti-immigration comments, Asian immigration comments in 1988, and his failure to repudiate Pauline Hanson quickly enough in 1996. So that's the first reason. The second reason would be that lots of little old ladies, Anglo little old ladies in Epping, have voted Labor for the first time, or maybe for the first time since 1972 or 1983. That's what it will take for Labor to win here. And uh, as you're saying, it's looking very possible. One, one quick thing, you might be able to see behind me lots of purple. Purple is Maxine McHugh's colour in this electorate. And in the kitchen here at the North Ride School of the Arts, there is an enormous bunch of purple flowers ready for Maxine McHugh, so they're certainly hoping for victory here tonight. Helen, um, too early to get depressed, but, but it's not looking good. Uh, look, uh, I think you'd have to say, Ray, that uh, it isn't looking good, and it's uh, very disappointing. I think uh, we had thought that uh, with the last uh, couple of polls, certainly the Morgan poll and the News poll, the trend was our friend, if you could say that, and uh, it had really tightened and had come right in and that we're in with the show. But I think uh, the early figures, particularly in New South Wales, where of course uh, uh, Labor has to do very well and it looks like at the moment they're travelling very well, will be very disappointing. We'll be very hopeful that we can hold in Victoria, uh, where of course uh, seats are 5% and up. Uh, Queensland's the unknown of course, but even there it seems uh, that that mightn't be all that well, uh, going all that well. So. I think you'd have to say that uh, it is disappointing, but there's a lot of postal votes to come, and uh, we have to, of course... O always the optimist? Always the optimist. You have to be, uh, Laurie, in all circumstances, and uh, we've run a very optimistic campaign, so uh, we'll just wait and see how it travels a bit longer before we uh, open the vein and hop in the bar. Well, the, the exit poll today shows that, uh, that Labor... Uh, 
if this is right, uh, wins 53 to 47, which is a pretty good win if, if Sky's exit poll is accurate. Um, more interesting, the bellwether seat in New South Wales, Eden Monero, which since 1972 has always gone with the government. According to the exit poll, that's a big win for Labor's uh, Mike Kelly, 58 to 42 over the uh, Liberal Party's Gary Nairn. And in the seat of Benelong, the Prime Minister's seat, if this exit poll is accurate, John Howard's in deep trouble because the exit poll has Labor at 53, Maxine McHugh, and John Howard and the Liberals at 47. Robert, can I just bring you, uh, I've been told by some of your party people, scrutineers over the last week or so, you expected this in Eden Monero, didn't you? expect expected a big jump. Yes, we did. Uh, we had a very, very good candidate, but basically national swings are national swings. Candidates can make up one or two percent difference. Um, our early figures through are very promising. We've just had a scrutineer ring in from MacArthur, 12 percent preferred vote swing to Labor. All the other figures very early, but Page, the first booth in, is a 12 percent swing. Uh, Eden Monero, just one or two booths at 6% and about 3.5% in Braddon. So for the seats that we're starting to worry about, the early signs are good. All right. And Michael, for you again, what's the mood in your seats? Well, Ray, very interesting. Um, this whole campaign has been typified by one thing, no anger. Very unusual for a government to be thrown at when there's no anger in the community. But, you know, I think the view is it's morphed beyond that people were just bored, tired with the government and these early figures are not good for us. Even at the polling booths today around the country are people reporting to me, no anger, um, just uh, no more people. Bats. No baseball bats. No uh, uh, They wore them out in 96. Um, just, just people might be over the government and if these early figures translate into swings later in the night, the government's in very serious trouble. Um, government's down about 6% in New South Wales, down a couple of percent in Victoria. So what we can't afford to do is to lose a chunk of seats in New South Wales and a chunk in Queensland. If that happens, we are in very serious trouble. Well, but what we may be seeing tonight, particularly in New South Wales and now maybe in Victoria, is that that class of 96 is in danger and is in, in, and is in fact losing. And this would really tell us something about the nature of the swing, because the nature of the swing may be now going back to 1996 proportions. It's too early to say it, but if you're seeing a seat like this in Victoria, in danger that in fact there is a strong underlying swing going on right up uh, right around the country. If you're we're looking at what then 30 odd seats? That... Well I'm not calling that I wouldn't no, call the that. I'm sorry the change in 96 I'm saying that. In, in, in 1996 there was a change of 30 odd seats. Yeah. That's right. All right let's have a look at Karangamite then also staying in Victoria that one of those that Robert mentioned earlier. That's right another seat we'll have has I have 29 percent counted so a big number of counted. Stuart MacArthur the Liberal 11 992 Labor's Darren Cheeseman, 11,561, and the Greens, Fiona Nilsson, 1,949. Uh, the Liberals, 44%, Labor, 42, and the Greens, 7.2%. 5.6% uh, swing to Labor, the Liberals down 7.9%. Uh, on that basis, Labor has 51% after preferences. 5.3% uh, would cost the Liberals a seat, a swing to Labor of 7.1%. So that looks like a Labor gain. Quite That's a lot the first one of the night we're actually calling, Robert. I wouldn't call it yet, no. I'm, I'm willing to say that we've won Bass. I'm willing to say we've won Eden Monero. Uh, and that one will need another 20% of the vote in yet. Good evening, Ray. Yes, I'm out in the seat of Deakin in Melbourne's far eastern suburbs tonight. Now, this has been a Liberal seat since way back in 1937, but for a couple of years in the mid-1980s when Labor was in power. Now, the incumbent out here is Phil Baresi, and uh, he held a margin of just 5%. Hot on his heels is the ALP's Mike Simon. Now, Mike is a big union man, and uh, there's a very strong blue-collar worker presence out here in Deakin, so uh, work choices is very much on the voters' mind minds out here and that would have played a huge part in their vote today. Now that said, the, uh, the traffic out here is also a major issue and uh, Peter Costello has committed $80 million to upgrading a major bottleneck out here and uh, that would play obviously on the minds of voters as well. So uh, it's interesting though with this that uh, the Labor Party did not commit any money to fixing this bottleneck and that's uh, interesting because of so many Me Too moments through this six-week campaign. But uh, it's a very interesting uh, night out here in Deakin tonight and we'll cross back to you later with some more results. The latest booth to come in in uh, the Prime Minister's electorate, mostly Chinese-based, 18% swing on the primaries. 18 in Benelong, 80%. Yes. In the one booth, yes. but um, that doesn't presage very well. It's hard to see him pulling out of this one, isn't it? Well, certainly Michael hasn't got it in his count at this stage. I don't blame him for not putting it there. Yeah. 
Um, well, people you'd... have written off John Howard before, I, I've noticed, in his career. Yes, oh, you have uh, several and, times, and, I know. But, and, and he knows when he could be coming back. You know, you've got to have a stronger challenger than Michael, uh, than Peter Costello, if you actually and, want to and, take him And Maxine McHugh. But, All right, uh, well, Wayne, we're going to regroup in a moment. Go ahead. Sure. I was just in, interested in the emergence of these seats up the coast, because if that's happening in New South Wales, I think you'll probably find that's happening in Queensland. So seats like Pinkler will become important in Queensland. This, uh, the the Sunbelt is what I call it really, which used to be National Party, is now becoming much more urbanised and it makes the Labor Party much more competitive in those areas. But uh, we're all here. I can tell you that Kevin Rudd is in the building. Uh, he's in a back room, we think, maybe just off to the side of that podium. If you can see the podium behind me, that's where obviously the Labor Party is hoping that he'll be claiming victory later on in the night. And off to the side there, we, there's a sort of a private room. We saw a few people disappearing back around there before. It hasn't been a blowout. Uh, you know, there were some, the Fairfax Press poll said 57 43. It doesn't appear to be anything like at that level as, as um, Laurie says, with 70% counted Labor on 53, a smidgen over 53. But if the coalition can, can contain losses in Queensland, and that does look difficult, and win a couple in Western Australia, they are still, they've still got a hope. There is still a chance. Um, I think it's unlikely, but there's still a chance. We'll know within the next few minutes. All right, let's go to the shredder. Let's look at the coalition losses and see what's happening. Sorry, Michael. Sorry, Helen, about this. Here's the shredder. Well, the, the computers consigning John Howard to the shredder. Stuart MacArthur consigned to the shredder. Phil Barassi from Deakin into the shredder. And Ken Ticehurst and Dave Bell get shredded. Uh, Gary Nair, another minister, and Eden Monero shredded. And Lindsay Karen Chichoff shredded. And Paige Chris Galaptis shredded. Well, the shredder's popular in Parramatta, Colin Robinson, it goes through the shredder. Wakefield David Fawcett into the shredder. We're saying the Nationals, with 5.3% of the primary vote, uh, have 10 seats but have lost two. The Labor Party, we're saying with 43.3% of the primary vote, has 71 seats uh, and has gained 16. Now, uh, in one sense, if you say it's gained 16, don't jump to the conclusion that that means they've won government, because we're still only giving them 71 seats at this point, but I think, Anthony, you're saying there's another eight where Labor are ahead. Yeah, well, what we're seeing at the moment, just to break that swing down across the country, we're seeing a swing of 6% in New South Wales. We're seeing a single swing of 5.1 in Victoria. Of course, the problem with 5.1 in Victoria, it's not the point where they start to win seats in Victoria. We're seeing 2.2 in Tasmania, but it's certainly enough to gain Bass and Braddon by the look of it. Um, we're seeing a single 2% in the ACT, 6.7 in South Australia, which is getting up towards uh, where more seats start to fall. And on the early figures, we've got 6% counted in Queensland. We're looking at a swing of 6.3% in Queensland. Now, what that translates to in terms of seats is on the chamber, we're seeing that we're definitely prepared to give away. Here we go. We are giving away 71 seats to Labor, Liberal 47, Nationals 10, and others too. And we're prepared to do a prediction for the first time tonight. At this stage, we are looking like 82 seats for Labor, and that gives Labor a majority of 14 seats at this stage. Now, there may be a bit of moving up and down on that, but at this stage, that is settling down. Um, if some of the, if Labor starts to slip behind in a few Queensland seats, then maybe Western Australia will matter. But at this stage, it's continuing to track towards a Labor government. OK, now, Anthony, let's just try and put this into a bit of historical perspective. Once you get to a stage like this where, where the computer is throwing up that prediction, um, you, as you say, you'll see some swirls and eddies, but are you saying that on, on past performance that, um, that that is a pretty reliable picture? The picture I'm seeing is that the government is behind in everything, in all the seats that Labor needs to win, uh, or in many seats that Labor needs to win. There's enough seats where the Labor Party is either we've already got them tracked for winning, we've got them gaining 16, though I'm always prepared to say that's up or down too, but they're also ahead in six other seats which we still class as doubtful, which were Liberal held. So that's why on this sort of basis, you know, this is a probability-based exercise, they're not going to suddenly turn around in those. Can we... Uh, sorry, Julie, you were going... Government is worth a look at, I think, on your figures, and I've got... Uh, sorry, let me just check. 5% counted, three booths, showing a 10.4% swing. Yeah. Uh, Longman is definitely in trouble for Mal Bruff. The primary vote swing is enormous at the moment, but um, I think we've got some changing... And that's with nearly 6% counted. Let's have a look at the changing graphic. And we might uh, continue our seat run now. We're getting more figures in, and the picture, I think, is starting to become clearer. 
Let's look at the seat of Longman. This is based around Caboolture and the southern Sunshine Coast, north of Brisbane, Melbrough, as we know. Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. He's held the seat since 1996 uh, by a margin of 6.7%. 6.3% of the vote counted. There is a very substantial swing to Labor, it would seem. Anthony. And uh, Mel Bruff is in a deal of trouble. The Labor Party primary vote is up 12%. Wow. And the Labor Liberal Party primary vote is only up, is down 6%. Now, that's put John Sullivan well ahead. Now, the, the primary percentages are not always very reliable guide here. Um, I'm actually talking about primary vote change. But we now have one preference booth in, which has brought the swing down to 7.9. But on the primary votes I was seeing, that was actually a larger swing. And at this stage, um, that's in doubt, but the Labor Party is ahead. So that's a significant swing in that seat. Now, Leichhardt, uh, right up in the far north of Queensland, based around Cairns and Cape York, uh, held by Warren Inch, um, for uh, how long? Uh, since 1996. Since uh, with a margin of 10.3%, uh, but we, it's only 3.3% of the vote counted, but already we're showing quite a, sub very, a, a very substantial swing. Yes, and these, these booths, we're seeing a change in the percentage primary votes here. Um, on those votes there, you can see that Jim Turner's on 44% and Charlie McKillop, the, the Liberal, on 348 the, the National on 42 We've well, got a preference count in four or 55 booths, a couple of, uh, I will, the, um, that, that's not correct, I'll explain what's happening here. If we can cut away from that graphic, please. <laughs> the swing is 13.9, I'm not sure. Here, Anthony. I'm not sure where that one came from. The swing is 13.9 on the figures I've got, but that is an enormous swing. There is certainly, I think that might be just one, um, I've just got another update and it's 13.6. So Labor's on track to win Leichhardt at this stage, I'd say. Uh, now Dawson, just uh, south of uh, Leichhardt and uh, your, uh, this is Deanne Kelly's seat. She's held it since 96. There's a big move on here. There's an She's enormous got a, move got a margin of 10%, but a very big swing. Labor Party looks set to win this seat at this stage. We've got a preference count in a third of the booths in this electorate. And at this stage, Deanne Kelly's on 46.3 to James Bidgood 44.5. But when we factor in the booths, and in fact we've got 22 preference um, booths in preference, we're seeing a 12.9% swing. That is a, an enormous swing, and it's been consistent all night in that electorate. So Deanne Kelly at this stage looks like losing to James Bidgood, a, a Mackay City councillor who's a finance director for a chain of local medical centres. So uh, is that is quite an upset. Julia Gillard, can you, uh, un have you got a, an explanation as to why you're seeing, the, admittedly an early swing, but nonetheless, 13.3% swing or 13.6% swing in Leichhardt around Cairns and a swing of 12-13% in Dawson. Well, I think Dawson, there's a demographic shift going on. The resources boom is bringing in more working people and I think those working people are rewarding us with their votes. I think industrial relations would be playing a big part in that. Uh, in Leichhardt, of course, you had a fairly messy campaign between the Liberal candidate and the National Party candidate with some odd insults exchanged, including the suggestion that a woman couldn't represent that seat. So I think All we're right. probably seeing some of that in play and the loss of an incumbent. Uh, I've got some figures on Flynn. Flynn's the newly yeah. created seat, uh, bigger than the state of Victoria, so not an easy place to campaign. We need 7.7 .7 off the extrapolation from last time. We're getting 7.4 with 10,000 votes counted, but they are 34 small booths. Yeah. We haven't seen Emerald and Gladstone come in yet. Right. Our candidate there, Chris Trevor, uh, Gladstone-based. He's run for the state seat of Gladstone in the past and got an extraordinary swing to him, more than 10%. Very well known local, uh, known as CT. Uh, it's one of the seats where we obviously worried about the amalgamation agenda playing in, but that makes it well and truly worth keeping an eye on as Emerald and Gladstone South come in. What would you nominate as the single most important issue of this campaign that has put Labor across the line? I think the thing that first caused the so-called Howard Battlers to look at the government again and not like what they saw was work choices. I think that that really did crack a substantial proportion of the so-called Howard Battlers off. Uh, once they saw one floor, then they started looking for a few more. So people re-engaged with politics. Then climate change undoubtedly became a template as to how the government had grown stale in office. And then the government lost touch on a series of cost of living issues and the puffed up claims about interest rates from the last campaign came back to bite them very strongly during this campaign. Uh, I think Kevin, uh, his 
uh, leadership since uh, taking over in December. Once again, people lifted their eyes, they looked at politics again. The contrast saw uh, a bloke who looked like a very safe pair of hands in Kevin Rudd, but a bloke with new energy and new ideas, and he was always hitting the chords with people that they wanted to hear. You know, industrial relations, they didn't want work choices. I think we struck our alternative right. The cost of living issues, Kevin really got out in front on, and climate change, he's campaigned on solidly all the way. So it wouldn't have happened without Kevin re-engaging that vote. I think we've got to assume that Chaser is at work there, but uh, we'll, we'll try and press on regardless. Yeah. Nick Minchin, did you see Kevin Rudd coming? Um, what I didn't see coming was the ALP renter crowd out the back here. Well done, Julia. <laughs> uh, you're assuming that, but uh, it could be much more to do with what Chase is up oh, to. Oh, I see. Right. Um, look, the, um, the government actually went behind the Labor Party um, while Kim Beasley was uh, leading the Labor Party. But is we it always fair to say that you were always confident while Kim Beasley was leading? Oh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, winning a fifth term of government in this country is incredibly difficult. I'm not conceding that we've lost, but winning five terms has only been done once by any one Prime Minister. Uh, that was Sir Robert Menzies. Uh, we knew this was going to be very difficult to hang on. We'd had swings to us in the last two elections. There was inevitably, I think, going to be a swing back to Labor. Um, I think without getting into a slangy match with Julia, um, Labor and the trade union movement very successfully demonised work choices. There's no doubt about that. Um, they made it, a, you know, the great big bogey man of this election. And that's there, been there quite a lot of bogeys thing. flying around, Nick. Well, work choices, I think, was for the Labor Party. That's the thing they've really been focusing on. The Labor, the union movement threw, what, $20, $30 million at it. That's been very tough for us um, and not easy to defend our position uh, on industrial relations. So I think that's been, a, Julia's right to say it's a factor. We can argue why it is a factor, but clearly that's been damaging to us. Uh, and then, of course, having won the last election on the issue of interest rates, interest rate increases since the election were always going to hurt as well, particularly, as I say, in seats like Longman. We've uh, seen the emergence of some Labor stars uh, tonight. Um, let's have a look at the Maribyrnong figures there for Bill Shorten. And see well, Bill back. Shorten, one of the most prominent of the trade union leaders who's switching to federal parliament in this election. Uh, he has 31,530 uh, primary votes in the seat of Maribyrnong. Uh, the Liberals, 16,566. This is a, a, a safe seat, so there's no contest really. 57.8% uh, share of the vote to uh, Bill Shorten. Uh, the scare camp ca campaign yeah. against union just hasn't worked, has it? It hasn't done well. No, not in this seat, and uh, I think you expect it to, really. He's got a 6.1% swing to him. And uh, he'll win that comfortably, as, as you'd expect. He's a very prominent candidate, very well known. And uh, everyone expecting him to do well in the election. All right, and I think we're going there. I think we've got... Uh, we can cross to Bill Cumbry. Hey, Nick Johnson. Hey. I can't hear you, Nick, for the moment. We'll the come. Bowls club we... in Moody Ponds tonight. Go ahead, Nick. You can hear me now? Yep. Yes, Ray, I'm out here at the Maribyrnong Bowls Club and you can hear the crowd here behind me tonight in the heart of Moody Ponds, which of course many Australians will know is the home of that famous Australian cultural export day, Medder Everidge. Well, tonight now it's also the home of Labor's Bill Shorten. He, of course, is one of the rising stars of the Labor movement and rose to prominence, if you like, during last year's Beaconsfield Mine Rescue. He's even been touted by some as a future Prime Minister. But, Bill, I suppose you might have to put those ambitions on hold for a little while yet, although it looks like you are now a Member of Parliament and, who knows, perhaps a uh, Minister in a new Labor government. Tonight's a fantastic outcome for Australia. Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard have achieved the most momentous swing and, who knows, who knows, maybe tonight there's been a change of government. You know, I can hear the fat, the fat lady clearing her throat I don't know if she's yet to sing, but the mood on the polling booths today is fantastic. The voters of Australia, certainly in my area, they like what they saw with Kevin Rudd. They like the, they like the, the new changes and the fresh plans. And they also... This is the first time there's been a chance to vote on the unfair work choice laws. For the first time ever, the Prime Minister, the former, who knows, the former Prime Minister submitted himself to the will of the people and those work choice laws got the thumbs down. Now what about out here in Maribyrnong, because you came into this election with a, about a 10%
buffer here. Do you expect that you'll actually increase your vote out here? The, it's still early figures, but there appears to have been a 7% swing on primaries to Labor, which is fantastic. The people of Maribyrnong, they need good health care, they want to see good education for their kids, they want to plan for the future, and they certainly believe that the government uh, hasn't done enough on climate change and they want fair workplace laws. That, I think, explains perhaps the fairly high swing to Labor here. Hey, Nick, well, congratulations. I, Enjoy Nick, the night, Bill. Certainly. Nick, can I ask you something there? We've heard yes, that Ray. We've had six weeks of policies. I'd like to hear what Bill thinks now. Here he is. He's a 40-year-old man. He's in the federal parliament. Tell me what he thinks personally. Uh, Ray wants to know exactly how are you feeling. I mean, it's been a long time coming. It's been a long campaign. Well, I mean, what's the feeling now actually knowing that you will be a member of parliament? It's a feeling of great responsibility. All the hands I shook today, all the doors I door knocked on, you know, there's a lot of people who put their trust in you. Now what I want to make sure is that this part of Melbourne, the western suburbs, gets its fair share. And I think that it's only under Kevin Rudd and Labor will they get their fair share. But it does, it's a big sense of responsibility. It's a privilege to serve in the federal parliament. And, you know, it takes my breath away. And I'm really, really chuffed with the fact that the voters of this area have put their faith into me and into Rudd Labor. And we won't let them down. Well, there you go, uh, Ray. That's... It's a very triumphant mood, as you can probably imagine, out here tonight in Mooney Pond. Certainly the Labor faithful are going to enjoy this night. I'm just simply saying that it's a very close result on the figures, and that's something Labor needs to be careful of. Do you worry about that, Wayne? I mean, if you are over the top, we've decided if it's more like four or five seats, is that a problem? We don't take the people of Australia for granted. We have got a strong mandate, but we don't take them for granted. And we will govern, whether it's two seats or ten seats, in the same way, responsibly. But 20 seats, the best of time for anybody, is a big swing, isn't it? This is a very big swing. We're, trying to, we're getting a bit of history rewritten here. You know, this is 53%, 54%. In Australian electoral history, these are very big results. Very big results. I mean, what, 55.8 is about the highest, isn't it? Yeah. I think those. Well... Ray, they're very, early, they're very early figures yet, and um, I've been on a winning side before, we hate all losers, and I've been on the losing side, and I congratulate Wayne and Robert and, uh, and um, uh, Julie Gillard and, of course, Kevin Rudd, if Labor have win. It's a great achievement to win federal government and uh, get into Parliament, go through the whole campaign and win, so I take my hat off to Labor if they have won. The only thing I'd say is that we've got the early results in now from Western Australia, and there's a swing against Labor in their three most marginal seats and there's a swing to the Liberal Party in its most three marginal. So the early result, and it's only 1% of the vote counted, so it's a small amount. But you don't but seriously Labor... think, Mike, you're not seriously no. saying at this time of the night that, that they could hold on? You know, I, I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that uh, if, uh, if Peter Onsolin's uh, analysis sticks, obviously it's a problem. But uh, I think we just need to wait and to see a little bit more. I'd just like to be a bit more certain about how certainly some of those northern Queensland seats shape up and then see what happens in Western Australia, what happens in Northern Territory. Well, they're not northern. Let's have a look at the two more Queensland seats, the seat of Dixon, Laurie. Well, another seat held by Minister Peter Dutton. Uh, Fiona McNamara for Labor is ahead of it, 4,059 votes. Peter Dutton, 3,796 and uh, 634 votes for the Green. <laughs> Labor with 45.8% of the primary votes. They've been for Liberals, 42.8. 10% swing to the Labor Party. And that would give the seat to Fiona McNamara, 52.7% uh, of the vote. Mm -hmm. So it'll probably go to the Labor Party. I don't, I, I, I don't see Peter Dutton recovering from that. And let's look at Flynn. We've got some Western Australian figures, but I do want to have a look at Sturt first. This is uh, uh, Adelaide's uh, inner eastern suburbs, held by Christopher Pine. A junior minister in the uh, Howard government, margin of 6.8 per cent. We've had uh, more than nearly 70 per cent of the vote counted and uh, a substantial swing to the Labor Party, but perhaps not enough, Anthony? Yes, well, at this stage, um, what we're getting is that Christopher Pine's ahead on the primary votes, we've got Amir Henshin, who's the Labor Party candidate. Um, there are some green preferences there, but there's only a small minor party vote going on at this stage. And this, it looks like there's a swing of 6.4 per cent. We've got uh, 35 of the 43 boos with a preference count. That one's still in doubt. Um, we could see a little bit of moving backwards and forwards, but Christopher Pine, as a sitting member, would be favoured to win from that point.
And we're going to Stephen Smith now, who's got an update on what's going on in Western Australia's home state. Give us uh, some sort of feeling, Stephen. Well, I think we're in trouble in, uh, in a couple of seats. I think we're in trouble in Stirling. Uh, I think we're in trouble in Cowan. I think uh, has luck. Uh, I've just had a report from the local scrutineers. I think we're still in, a, in with a show in Hasluck. And I think Swan is very, very tight. Uh, we, we've got the local member incumbency, so uh, we're still in the hunt in Swan. But, um, on a good day on what we've seen so far, uh, it'll be two all, which will be a score draw. On a bad day, we'll either drop one or trade one. So the overall picture and how that affects the national count, more uh, importantly? Net, net, net score draw or minus one to Labor on a real bad day in the West, minus two. Um, so that'll, I think, on Anthony Green's tally would bring it back to uh, 20 or low 20s seats win for Labor, oh, net we, win for Labor. We, we haven't got much time uh, on this cross, but uh, what is going on in Western Australia, do you believe? What's, what's, what's causing this? Well, there's a, there, can I just say there's a big green vote, so I think that reflects, uh, reflects a, um, a bit of, sort of dissatisfaction with both Labor and and the government firstly secondly 10 percent economic growth for two or three years john howard takes the credit for that without necessarily being the cause of it uh, and it was it's just harder for us to get the message through and being being blunt about it uh, you have the worst excesses of the ugly face of unionism in the west which hasn't helped us at all all right stephen thanks very much we'll leave you there thanks. and then what's your thought what are your thoughts on this on the trends what put it put tonight in some perspective for us yes well <clears throat> i think um uh, to the extent that it has been dominated by issues to do with climate change, that's very interesting. I mean, climate change is a very, very complex matter. And I would have thought that on any objective assessment, uh, you would see that the coalition had obviously addressed and was addressing climate change. And if that was really the issue, you wouldn't see the sort of result that Malcolm Turnbull's got in Wentworth if, in fact, that was uh, some uh, uh, passing of judgment on the ability of the coalition to look at uh, look at those matters and we have so i don't know he that could that's... be the exception of the rule of course couldn't no it? not necessarily but what i'm saying is that it was addressed and so much about this i think is perception such as for example a new uh, national broadband i mean that is going to be such a pie in the sky non-deliverable commitment that won't even be available till 2013. But so it, it, it wasn't perception, though, for all those years when Kyoto was off the drawing board, when Kyoto, when, was, when Kyoto was simply ignored, when Kyoto No, that's was, true. Oh, no, that I, think it, I think everyone's green. I think every single person, now, whether you live in a, an urban environment and you've got water shortages or you're living out on a rural property and you're trying to access your quota, or whether you're trying to run a, a cotton farm, whatever it is, everyone has got issues, related issues, of climate change and water as big priorities. But there's something missing in this whole equation because the cost of it has to be factored in and people who are going to be impacted helped. And Labor have been silent on that. Have they been silent? Well, the government hasn't been green enough even to ratify Kyoto. And Malcolm Turnbull basically tried to do that, leaked the fact that he tried to do that, that may well have helped him this evening. All right, I want to show you some uh, some live pictures now, live uh, shots from Benelong. Lots of supporters wearing uh, Maxine McHugh's A Strong Voice for Benelong t-shirt. Still a bit quiet there now. We're told that she would, might come down about 9.15. This was the scene a short time ago in the tally room with the figures showing Maxine McHugh a likely Benelong winger. That was from here. And that was our tally room shot there just behind us when the figures were showing it looks as though she might be going to beat the Prime Minister. You'd like to talk about uh, Liberal Party leadership. Well, I, I don't think it's too early to start talking about that because there were strong rumours ahead of the election that if they lost, Peter Costello might not be interested in going on. That said, some of that was based around how they were going to go in terms of how badly they lost if they did lose. Um, has he been damaged by the co-equal leadership with John Howard? Has he, in a sense, been tainted from being able to start as a fresh leader, uh, which is what most new leaders of the opposition get to do? Uh, the other question is, is someone like Malcolm Turnbull, who we all know is incredibly ambitious, is someone like him going to be buoyed by his result in Wentworth compared to how the party did everywhere else around the country? So they're not going to be in power anywhere. Campbell Newman is going to be the most senior elected official of the Liberal Party, and he's the Lord Mayor of Brisbane. So there's a lot of fundraising difficulties there for them as well. A period of introspection, I suspect, will start. Michael Kroger, do you think that uh, Peter Costello has suffered from this, being the, the co-leader of the party? Um, well, I don't think so. Um, 
he and John Howard were a fantastic partnership for 11 and a half years. Um, he'll go down as the greatest treasurer in the history of the country. John Howard is probably next to Menzies the best Prime Minister ever. Obviously it's a terrible tragedy to, to seemingly lose Ben Long as we seem to have done tonight. Um, he's gone down with the ship. Uh, it was a great government. It's a tragedy's loss, but we accept the result of the Australian people. We congratulate Kevin Rudd and, uh, and Wayne Swan and Julian Gillard on their victory. Um, well, but, a provocative uh, it's a great, question, Michael. It's a great Would the result tragedy. have been different if they changed leaders last year? Well, we don't know the answer to that, Laurie. We don't know the answer to that. We, we, what, what, we do do know, what we do know is Labor's campaign would have had to be entirely different because we would have been running on new leadership. But then we wouldn't have been running on the strengths of the Prime Minister. I mean, he had four election victories. He had a tremendous wealth of support in the community as a figure had been in politics for 30 years. He'd won four elections in a row, so he wouldn't have the wealth of his experience. But that's a question we'll never know the answer to. Yeah, that, uh, that graphic is saying that uh, Ben Along is an ALP gain. We're saying that it's yet to be completely played out. It's going to be hard to work out which uh, cheering is coming from where Maxine McHugh is and which is coming from the tally room. Let's look at the cliffhangers now. We'll see what it well, might be. Ben Along is, is a cliffhanger. Uh, the Labor Party is 1,708 votes ahead uh, of John Howard there. Uh, in Dixon, Labor has a 216 vote lead. In Flynn, Labor has a 332 vote lead. Latrobe, Labor's ahead by 156. Uh, in Patterson, Labor has an 893 vote margin. In Sturt, Labor's ahead by 1,820 votes with 53% counted. So Christopher Pine's in a lot of trouble in Sturt. All right, and Robert, you were saying something about Ben Long. What can you tell us about the PM? Peter, just every time you mention Ben along, you get a cheer uh, from behind. We've still got about 20, maybe 18 per cent of the count to come tonight. There is a higher pre-poll vote right across Australia than ever before. And so when normally electorates close in at 82 per cent, tonight maybe 75, 76, 77. Tell us what you mean by that. What's a higher pre-poll vote? Well, people either vote postal, pre-poll, or absentee. Normally it constitutes 14, 15% of the total vote. Tonight you might be looking at 16, 17, 18%. Any idea why? I just think it's more convenient. And will that help John Howard? Going to get him out of trouble? <coughs> I don't think so. I mean, you're looking at about a 0.2 increase in the best he's ever done. So unless he can drag that margin down by about another 0.5 by the end of the night, I don't think it'll help him. But we'll do the calculations when we get the final figures. Yep. Queensland has delivered 10 seats uh, to the Labor Party tonight. Having said that, we're now going to look at the seat of McEwen in uh, Victoria. Uh, this is in central Victoria. It's held by Fran Bailey, uh, John Howard's Minister for Small Business and Tourism. She's had it since 1996 with a margin of 6.4%. 74% uh, of the vote counted, Anthony. Yes, well, she's, um, she's at this stage held on to the seat. That uh, She's ahead on the primary votes there. There's a significant vote there for the Greens, 45.7 to 40.8 on the primary votes. A lot of the Green preferences are flowing to Labor. And at this stage, there's a 5.8% swing to Labor, but it's certainly not enough. And it looks like Friend Bailey's been returned. We can cross, uh, amidst the shouting, uh, sorry about that, Fran Bailey, but we can cross to you in McEwen. You've, uh, that was for me. <laughs> I don't think it was for you, actually, but uh, nonetheless, you have, you've retained your seat. What are, what are the 96, class of 96, and you're still there battling away by the look of it? Uh, yes, it's a, a real nail-biting night tonight, and... Uh, it's, uh, we've got uh, about uh, 4,600 odd postal votes out there, which uh, we should do very well with those as well. Tell me, you, you obviously believe you've retained your seat, you're comfortably retaining it, is that right, Fran? Um, I, I wouldn't say comfortably. I, I think it's, uh, it will go right down to the wire, but it's looking at the moment uh, uh, optimistic for us. Let me ask you while I've got you there about the bigger picture. You're going to lose a lot of colleagues if you do come back to Parliament. It'll be in opposition. There'll be a lot of empty seats. A lot of people that you used to sit next to in Parliament won't be there. 
Well, that would appear from what we're seeing as if that that will be the case. It's still, you know, we, we don't know exactly what the picture is. I think this election has actually told us a number of things. If you look at the green vote in McEwen, which is polled at, at, at least 10% right across the electorate. I think what the people of McEwen have been saying is that they are very comfortable, they know what the economy is doing for them, but they're wanting something a bit more. What do you think has happened in the, in the Victorian seats, so stick with your own state, in the Victorian seats which you appear to have lost tonight, what do you think has happened there? What are the telling issues? And let, let me ask you this, just as a corollary to that, do you think a lot of it is to do with the campaign and how it was run. Oh, look, it's far too early to make any judgment about that. Um, I, I think that um, it is very interesting looking at the swings that, uh, uh, that we have suffered against us, especially in the regional areas, uh, when we have worked very, very hard. Uh, we've been getting very positive feedback. Uh, and, you know, we, we've got to take a, a very good, hard look at the situation. But tonight is a... It's a, it's a little bit too early to go making any, any quick judgments. But just in case you're wondering uh, where all the noise is coming from, some of it you could put down to spontaneous euphoria, some of it you could put down to television networks who don't have enough confidence in their own capacity to sustain an audience with the serious analysis of, uh, of this exercise of democracy around Australia and they're having to resort to some clown tricks, but we'll try and persist. If we look at it, the overall percentage votes by party, you can see in terms of the change in the primary vote, a big swing to Labor, 5.9%, their primary vote is up, up. The Coalition, their vote does seem to have come back in the last couple of days, and certainly there's more minor party vote than was suggested by some earlier polls in this campaign. Um, Family First polled 1.9% there, the Greens 7.8%. The Democrats are down to 07 at this election. And I've asked for one more graphic, which is Queensland. Um, and the reason for this is 50.7, swing of 7.8%. This is only the third time since the war that Labor's got a majority of the two-party preferred vote in Queensland. So certainly um, the Queenslanders decided they seem to want a Queenslander for Prime Minister. They've won the Sheffield Shield, now they've got a Prime Minister. <laughs> um, the, um, it's the first elected Prime Minister since um, Fisher in the First World War. They've had uh, both Fadden and um, Ford filled in briefly. briefly. Um, but certainly Labor's got 16 seats in Queensland, which is over half the seats, and given how paltry their representation has been, it's certainly this result's been decided in New South Wales and Queensland. They were the states which gave the Howard government its majority in 1998 and 2001 and also in 2004. This time, Labor's got a majority in both. OK, we're, go we're going to cross very quickly to Mel Bruff in his seat of, in, in his seat of Longman because uh, uh, he had a margin of 6.7% there. It would appear he's lost his seat. Uh, now, can you tell me, is he standing by? OK, Mel Bruff. In Australian, I am very, very proud of the chance that I've had to represent the country at the highest level. Um, the work that we have commenced in the Northern Territory, I just hope and pray continues. Um, I took the chance during this campaign to go back out to places like Hermansburg and to uh, Mutajulu, and I, I saw in the eyes of the women out there their desperate need to see this continue. So I have a plea to Mr Rudd that I know that you don't agree with much of what I've done out there, but um, not for me, not for some ideology, but for the children of the next generation, please give them a chance, give this a chance to work. There are great people out there on the ground doing that. Bob Brown, thanks for joining us. And uh, let, me, let me start by asking you, that's OK, let me start by asking you what, it's predictable, I suppose, what you're going to say, but let me start by asking you what, you, what message voters have delivered tonight, in your view. Well, Tony, it's a great vote for the Greens here in Tasmania. This is the biggest vote in the Senate for a third political party in Australian history. And it's a huge vote against the pulp mill and for saving Tasmania's forests. But it's more than that. The uh, enormous vote for Labor and uh, this sweeping victory for Kevin Rudd and the new government means that Australians want to fix climate change they want a more socially just country, and they've voted for it very strongly tonight. Bob, uh, the Greens vote nationally, uh, the figures I've been given, only up 0.6 of a percent since the last election. Is that because of the strong vote that Labor is picking up everywhere? 
Yes, a big, a big uh, squeeze there because of the swing to Labor, but what a remarkable thing for the Greens to stay in front. And in Melbourne, for example, up around 25%, we've leapfrogged the Liberals, putting us into a great position to be taking seats there, further down the line in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, we're up 2 to 3% right across the country on early counts. And here in Tasmania, we've busted that uh, barrier of a quota. We've gone way above that, and we're moving towards uh, a second quota in the future. Andrew Wilkie's not out of the race yet. I predict we'll pick up a Senate seat in Victoria with Richard Di Natale. Kerry Nettles got a strong chance in New South Wales. The, the last figures coming in from Queensland are improving, and I think we'll pick up a seat in Western Australia. Not certain yet that there won't be a hostile Senate. But if there is a Greens in the balance of power, we'll be working with the next government to make sure all Australians get a better outcome. Good evening, everyone. I know you've been here a long time. I'm very sorry to have kept you waiting. <laughs> This has been an amazing night. A wonderful, a wonderful night for Labor. A fabulous, I hope, transforming moment for the country. Now, something may have happened in the last 20 minutes, but when I last look at the figures, Ben Along is on a knife edge. Ben Along is still on a knife edge. The result is not clear, but what a wonderful, wonderful campaign this has been. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull, the Environment Minister, uh, a minister who had a huge battle on his hands in the seat of Wentworth, has uh, just emerged and he's speaking. In this, uh, in this, uh, in this climate, uh, in this climate is something that we can all be very proud of. So I want to thank you all for your support, your hard work. This is your win. Uh, and I, above all, I want to thank the people of Wentworth the community I love, the community I've lived my whole life with and that I've traversed from length to length by every bus route imaginable. <laughs> and you know, you know something, they, the, the great thing about this little part of the world in which we live is that everybody's equal. You know, the, the democracy of the surf, the democracy of the surf club, I go back to my early my boyhood and I look, see out there one of my father's dearest friends Reg Mar Winnie has been working here today and you know when I used to go down to North Bondi Surf Club with my dad as a little boy we'd be there in the showers with everybody from the you know QCs and judges and surgeons and businessmen to garbos and everybody the whole range of humanity was there but we have a great there's a great egalitarianism in this society in which we live, and that's that's that, is that 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 you know we talk about our wonderful beaches and the harbour and the parks and all of those great things we have, but it is the people of Wentworth, the people and the culture of this community, this really Australian egalitarian culture that we share here. That's what makes, that's what really makes this the best part of the best country in the world. And with your support, I'll be working for the next three years to ensure that it stays that way. Thank you very much. That was, that was Malcolm Turnbull, uh, who, has, who has retained his seat of Wentworth tonight um, against uh, enormous opposition. But uh, Malcolm Turnbull, 
may be out of trouble, but uh, there are a number of ministers who've been struggling tonight. Kerry, yeah, well, as we've seen, heard it and seen it fev at fever pitch inside the tally room, out, outside the tally room, the people have been lining up for hours waiting to get in. The queue has been snaking right around the back of the building here. I've got Pat and John here with me. How long have you two been here? Uh, two hours, two and a half hours. Yep, getting close to that. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you prepared to wait? This is such a momentous event. I hope we change of government in Australia. We live in Canberra and we're really happy to be here as part of this process. I know you've been listening to the broadcast while you've been here. A lot of things have happened in those two hours and we've just heard, um, of course, the uh, Labor looks as though clearly won this election. Maxime McHugh not quite prepared to uh, call it, but what, do you, what have you been feeling about this result? I think it's a great uh, message to the Liberal Party that it's uh, time's up and uh, they've got to move on. OK, let's check out some others and see how they're feeling. Come on. How, are you excited? What, what's your feeling here? Why are you lining up? Oh, my husband is seeing. We're tourists. <laughs> <laughs> so come to see what the Australian people have to say. And, um, well, the Australian people have spoken and I think it's, uh, they've spoken well. They seem to stand for a population that works, a population that is free to say what it has to say, and I think that's it. Thank you. There's all sorts of people out here. How long have you been lining up? Um, not for very long, about maybe 20 minutes or so. And what made you decide to make the dash to the tally room? Um, 11 and a half years is too long, um, and we're here to celebrate, basically. You don't mind it that it seems to be all over by the shouting? Oh, not at all. No, this, this, <laughs> oh, no there's going to be lots more shouting. <laughs> I, I can't tell you what it means to me and my family to see such a wonderful group of people here tonight. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for working all day today and for working on this campaign and for making this, I believe, the best campaign we've ever had in Higgins. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> The, uh, the results that have been uh, posted uh, tonight, which of course don't include postal votes, and we have uh, 5,000 postal votes uh, in the pot, uh, show uh, a swing absent of postal votes of about 1.8 per cent uh, against us here in Higgins. But when the postal votes are taken into account, we will have a swing to us in the seat of Higgins. So, Can I say, as I went around 37 booths today and I saw so many people who were working so hard, doing your bit for our campaign and for our country, doing it on a voluntary basis, I really do want to say that this is the best public spirit, the best tradition of Australian civic engagement, that you really are wonderful people and my thanks go out to each and every one of you here today. Thank you. It appears on a national basis as if there's been a swing of the order of uh, 5%. Uh, it appears that uh, as a consequence of that, uh, that Labor has uh, won uh, significant seats uh, throughout uh, the country uh, and may well have even won one or two seats uh, here in Victoria. Um, the consequence of that uh, uh, will uh, be uh, known to you. Um, it will uh, lead to a change of government. I think uh, that's pretty clear. And uh, I won't be doing any analysis tonight in relation to that. Uh, you will have speeches from each of the party leaders in due course and they will do their analysis. 
what I intend to do is I intend to speak to my colleagues. I've spoken to a number of them already. Uh, to speak to them uh, about their futures. I want to pay tribute to those members who have lost their seats. I want to say each and every one of you was a valuable member of the Liberal national team. Uh, I want to congratulate every one of my colleagues that has retained uh, his or her seat. Uh, they are a fine group of people. I've always believed that the highest form of service in any society is public service. Noel Pearson, I, I don't quite know what that was all about, but we're, we have the highest regard for Noel and we'll certainly Well, talk we know what it was all about because, in fact, your leader has said that he won't go ahead with this, uh, make the, the constitutional referendum a priority. No, that's not quite what he said, but anyway, we'll sit down and talk to Noel Pearson. But you know, the man, the man that would never, would never concede, really, I mean, he, every time he was knocked down, he, he came back up. He was Lazarus with the triple bypass. Uh, and when he did eventually make it uh, as Prime Minister, he stayed for nearly 12 years. Well, I would hope tonight that even Labor voters would concede some of the great things John Howard has done for the country. Yes, I accept that, uh, you know, Labor people and Labor supporters have their complaints, but, you know, John Howard has been uh, an extraordinary leader for this country, uh, particularly, I think, of the times when he's led us through tragedies, you know, the, the, uh, the shooting in Hobart, uh, the Port Arthur massacre, the, the, the in Bali, the, 9-11. Um, the Prime Minister has uh, done an extraordinary job in uniting the country at those really difficult times and I, I would hope all Australians would genuinely concede um, the, the leadership he's shown in those difficult circumstances. The country is enjoying extraordinary prosperity, um, you know, unemployment, all those things, I won't recite them, you know what I mean, but, but John Howard has been, it's been a privilege for me to work for him, um, for him to have been Prime Minister for this length of time through the sort of difficulties we've had to keep this country growing and prosperous uh, and, and really to take on some really tough things. I mean, nobody ever thought you could introduce a goods and services tax in government the way we did. Um, our industrial relations reforms may well have cost us this election, but you know, we really we knew they were risky, but we really believed they were the right thing to do to this country. So I, 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 all I can do is pay incredible tribute to John Howard tonight. I'm, so sorry to see this happen tonight, obviously. Um, to see a, a man like John Howard possibly lose his seat in this government is frankly tragic for those of us on the conservative side of politics. But tonight's a night to pay tribute to an extraordinary leader. I think the other issue here is the extent to which the Liberal Party's now lost a generation of talent in the Parliament. I think that's what happens when uh, the feats of this magnitude come along. And in losing Mal Bruff, they have lost someone who was, who was part of the future. You were someone who was spoken of as a possible deputy leader, in fact. That's right, and I think they've lost a lot of representation in Queensland as well. Mm. And that certainly puts them behind the eight ball, given the way the electoral momentum in this country is moving. Seats moving north. Well, what's he going to say? What can he say? I think he's going to be working very hard to try to be as dignified as he can be. He knows that this is his last act as Prime Minister, in a sense. So he will try to front the cameras. He'll be around supporters who will be cheering him, who will make sure that they keep him uplifted. And he will try to avoid giving across any sense of being hurt by this. Malcolm Fraser broke down and cried when, when he conceded defeat. John Howard was in his cabinet as his treasurer. He'll be trying to avoid doing that. He'll try to go out with as much dignity as he can. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether he goes onto stage with his family around him, like he often does and always has done for victory. He might uh, insist that they stay to the side so that he can bear this himself, or they may insist, no, Dad, no, husband, uh, we're going to be there with you. So it'll be interesting to see. Because one of his really positive attributes is that he doesn't give in. He is the long-distance runner, the long-distance campaigner. Well, now, um, this is it. There's no, not a matter of giving in. There's, uh, you've been beaten. This is it. I, I wouldn't be surprised in his, in his speech if he makes the point that he has always accepted that the, that the public doesn't get it wrong. He always tries to say that. Well, I don't know whether he truly believes that in his heart of hearts at this election, but, you know, the, if he stands by that motto, then the public didn't get it, a, get it wrong this time and it was time for a change of government. It's not the way he wanted to end his career. The family aren't with him yet. They may be at the roster, of course, they may have come separately, but uh, I think, as Peter said, we probably would have expected uh, the daughter and the boys to be there. Yes, well, Jeanette's there. Yeah, I must say, which, when uh, they appeared on Kerry Ann's show just the day or two before the end of the campaign, um, I thought Mr Howard, with uh, 
your doors, Mrs. Howard. I thought uh, with her there, he was relaxed and calm and looked more comfortable than he looked in the campaign. Yes, and, and, and I, I couldn't imagine her not being with him at a moment like this. Oh. Yeah, there, there they are, there's the family. family. The kids Mrs. are there. Without the grandson, he's probably in bed. Yeah. Here's Mr. Howard. Please. Uh, my fellow Australians, a few moments ago I telephoned Mr Kevin Rudd and I congratulated him and the Australian Labor Party on a very emphatic victory. We love you, John! We love you, Johnny! Now, this is a great democracy and I want to wish Mr Rudd well. He assumes the mantle of the 26th Prime Minister of Australia and I want to say there is no prouder job in the world than anybody can occupy than being the Prime Minister of this country. <clears throat> I wish him well in the task that he will undertake. And I want to say on behalf of the Coalition that has governed this country for the last 11 and a half years, that we bequeath to him a nation that is stronger and prouder. <laughs> a nation that is stronger and prouder and more prosperous than it was 11 and a half years ago. <laughs> and can I say to all of you that um, it has been an immense privilege every day of my life over the last 11 and a half years to have been the Prime Minister of this beautiful country. And I want to thank... I want to thank... I want to thank the Australian people for the privilege that they have given me over that period of time. I respect it and I honour it, and it's something that uh, has really been the most unbelievable experience. The Australian people are the greatest people on earth, and this is the greatest country on the earth. I've led a government that has taken this country from deep debt to strong prosperity. I've led a government that has never shirked the difficult decisions. I've led a government that has reformed the Australian economy and left it the envy of the world. I want, to, I want to extend to a number of people my deep gratitude. I want to thank all of my parliamentary colleagues for their loyalty and their dedication over these long years in government. I want particularly to thank Mark Vale and his two predecessors, John Anderson and Tim Fisher, both of whom served as Deputy Prime Ministers, to my own Deputy and Treasurer Peter Costello, I owe a very special debt. I owe a very special, special debt of gratitude. He's been a wonderful steward of the Australian economy, and the future of our party is very much tied up with Peter Costello. He is very much our future. And I want to say to those of my colleagues who have fallen in, in electoral battle today. Please, please. For those of, for those of my... Please, please. Julia Gillard, um, you got your running shoes on? <laughs> I have got my running shoes on, and Kevin's serious. It will be to work tomorrow, I can feel it. So we will hit the ground running. So um, you'll, you'll fly to Brisbane? I'll certainly be joining Kevin, yes, and we'll be working away. 
Uh, can I say, Kerry, it's just been my absolute privilege to work with Kevin in this campaign. It's just a tremendous honour to be with him as his deputy. Uh, this is obviously an important night, uh, important night, hopefully uh, in the nation's story too, as we move towards implementing our plans for the future. And if you just indulge me one moment, Kerry, I'd obviously like to uh, thank my family, to thank my partner, Tim, who's waiting for me, my sister, Alison, my mother and father, who were watching in South Australia. My father campaigned with Nicole Corns today, so uh, yeah. he'll be a little bit sad about that, but I think happy about everything else to my niece and nephew, Jenna and Tom, and to my staff, my Chief of Staff, Ben, Kimberly Gardner, Rhonda Wright, Velt, Silvana, Sarah, Jackie, uh, Rachel, they've just all been amazing and I'd like to thank them for everything they've done. Kimberly and Rhonda have been on the road with me for a very long period of time. Julia, just looking back uh, over Labor's years in opposition, um, you had your leadership problems. Uh, Kim Beasley through two elections, then Simon Crean, who didn't actually get to an election, then Mark Latham, then back to Kim Beasley. Um, but suddenly it's all coalesced. Uh, behind Kevin and there were maybe five or six people who had leadership aspirations. The party seemed to be in a real kind of um, uh, almost crippled really uh, and then suddenly in less than a year it's all coalesced around Cle Kevin Rudd. And Kevin's led from the front. It's certainly been his agenda and it's his agenda for the nation's future. Uh, we've obviously had our trials and tribulations in opposition. Opposition's a uh, difficult days and Labor's experienced some of those but I do think we went out and listened to the community and we put together an agenda for change and Kevin's just done a remarkable job in the less than 12 months he's been leader and a remarkable job during the campaign just unbelievably sure-footed um, you know no one could outwork him he's just you know amazing uh, and intellectual grasp touch with the Australian community you couldn't possibly ask for better Nick Minchin, uh, before you go and put the boxing gloves on again tomorrow, <laughs> some quiet reflections, if you like, about the Kevin Rudd that you've witnessed and the transition of Kevin Rudd from uh, opposition frontbencher to leader and now Prime Minister-elect. Well, can I first um, thank him for his very gracious remarks about John Howard that was dignified and appropriate and welcome. Uh, I join with John Howard in congratulating Kevin Rudd and Julia and their team on a remarkable victory. Uh, and for the sake of Australia, I hope they are a good government. Uh, we will be a robust and constructive opposition um, and we will be working hard now to win the 12 seats I think it is that we need to, um, to get back into government next time with a 2 or 3 per cent swing. I leave office as Prime Minister of Australia with our nation prouder and stronger and more prosperous than it has been. Friends, the Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd.